Well, it's uh, good to be back with you uh, this evening. Uh, I came across something on the radio the other day, which I want to share with you. Forgive me if I've done this before in the last few weeks. But I, I, I was listening to Radio 4. Now, I, I'm sure you know that I don't look like the normal Radio 4 listener. But I was in the car and, and I came across this. It was during their, well, religious five minutes that they had or used to have in the mornings. Uh, and they were discussing Easter. And the particular person who was a vicar said, at last we now are able to present Easter in a fan family friendly manner. The fantastic news is the world can celebrate Easter minus the blood and the gore. In our modern and enlightened society, individuals no longer want to be presented with a message of such brutality and bloodshed. More churches should take the decision to clean up the message. This will make Easter less offensive and thus more attractive to many more interested parties. Well, I was shouting at my radio, not that that would change anything. Uh, that's where we are with regards to Christendom and the Eastern message. I want to do something slightly different than what you might be expecting, and I want to read just a few verses from Philippians chapter 3. Now, Philippians 3, the first, what, seven verses or so, Paul speaks of who he was and what he thought that made him righteous and how he was a Pharisee, circumcision, all of this. Uh, but in verse 7, he goes on to say, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, this is the verse I want to focus on. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And that is the word of the Lord. Well, as we know, this is Resurrection Lord's Day. 24 hours all over the world today. The words will be, no doubt, read out, he is not here, he is risen. Come see the place where he lay. When Paul wrote these words that we've just read, he was exultant, he was enraptured when he thought concerning the resurrection. Uh, and the word of God says that God powerfully raised him, that is Jesus, from the dead. And praise God, as Christians, we have an empty cross and an empty tomb. We read in Philippians 2 verse 9, Because of this, God raised, up him, raised him up to the heights of heaven and gave him a name that is above every name. Yes, God the Father exalted the Lord Jesus. He is enthroned and acclaimed the Saviour. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. He is crowned with glory and honour. As the old hymn penned by Thomas Kelly puts it, the crown that once, the, the head was, that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. And I hope the fact that Jesus is alive 
really gets you reasonably excited this evening. We serve a risen Saviour. Uh, and one of my favourite uh, gospel songs penned by Bill and Gloria Gaither is this one. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living. Why? Because he lives. And that's what Paul was focusing in on right here in Philippians. He looks over his shoulder in verses 7 to 9 and he pays tribute to God's extravagant grace in his life. Then in verses, the verses to follow, he, he looks forward by faith to the future with a sense of anticipation. He writes in one of his epistles, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from, from there. We can only await a saviour from there if that saviour is alive. And indeed he is. And so in the light of time and indeed of eternity, on bended knee before the higher throne, Paul bears his very heart. This is what he longs for most than, more than anything else in the world. In his own words, he testified in verse 8 that he considers everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's a fervent aspiration for a life that's really worth the living. In a few words, Paul spells out his vision statement, and here it is. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul yearns and hungers for four things. Firstly, he wants to know Christ more deeply. That's personal. The bottom line is this, that Paul has seen so many people in his work and ministry who seem to be content to kind of meander their way through the Christian life. But that wasn't for him. He's taking the high road. Mediocrity and humdrum, it's not his cup of tea whatsoever. He never got bored of knowing Jesus or indeed speaking to others about Jesus. These words are the cry of a man who earnestly is seeking after his God, of a man who means business with God, of a man who puts aside all the trimmings and trappings and, uh, and regulations and traditions of, of, of church life, of a man who wants to spend the rest of his life on a higher plane, who wants to soar, as it were, to heights unknown. And if you'll pardon the mashup, Paul could easily have said, but when I rise to realms unknown and see thee on thy glorious throne, hallelujah, what a saviour. That's the saviour he wanted to serve every moment of every day. He longed for Jesus, simply Jesus. Nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. He says, Lord, I want to know you better. I want to know you more. And that's deeply challenging for us. Do we have that same desire, moment by moment, day by day, living above the humdrum, on that exciting level with a living relationship with God? Graham Kendrick captures, I believe, the sentiments of Paul's desire in the words of the, the song that he wrote, All I once held dear, built my life upon 
all this world reveres and wants to own. All I once thought gain, I count to the loss. Spent and worthless now, compared to this, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. That was Paul's consuming passion. It was the throbbing ambition in his life. It was the reason why he got up out of his bed every morning to face hardship. Oh, yes, he first came to know the Lord on the Damascus Road with that when Jesus appeared to him in the, the, the bolt of white fire and spoke to him in person. But that intrusion was okay just for starters, as far as Paul was concerned. Paul wants a relationship to be more than just a casual, polite acquaintance. He wants much more. For want of a better word, he wants the buzz. He wants to be connected in that experiential way. It's not just to know with the intellect not just ticking the boxes. He wants to know in, in a very intimate and powerful way. Uh, it causes the pulse to race and the heart to beat faster. Now, if we think about it, I guess to a certain degree, we know the prime minister. We might not know what he's doing. And sometimes I wonder if he knows, but that's another matter altogether. We know his name. We know where he lives. But I don't think any of us tonight know him personally. And there's a mega difference between knowing someone and really knowing someone. I was speaking to someone this week who came from the islands and we were speaking about traditions and they shared this with me. Seemingly in the, the, the highlands and islands of Scotland in days gone by, many of the traditional crofts had two reception rooms. One was called a butt and the other was called a ben. And no matter whom came chapping at the door, they automatically were shown into the butt. When a special friend came along, however, it was very different. They were taken into the ben. You see, there was no difference in the warmth of welcome, but there was a huge difference in the relationship. And I was told that's why very often crofters would say among themselves, I see you are far been with so-and-so. If you don't understand the language, Margaret Langlands, I'll translate it later on when we're finished. Paul says in verse 10, and pardon the paraphrase, I want to be far bend with God. That's what he says. The old hymn by Eliza Hewitt sums things up very, very eloquently. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More more about Jesus. Yes, says Paul, I know him because he's my rock. He's my redeemer. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but I'm not satisfied. I want more. The, the, the bites of the cherry of grace and mercy have only whetted my appetite. I have this insatiable desire. I have an unquenchable thirst to know more of Jesus, the lover of my soul. Now I had to stop there. And I had to think. As you know, I do frequently if you're on on the Tuesdays or Thursdays. Is that true of my life? Or am I happy just to get by, just to make it through the day, reasonably satisfied, put their head, my head down at night, go to sleep, get up the next morning, do the same again? Or do I have that 
desire within to know more. If we want that desire to become reality, it will take three things. Firstly, it will take time. Any meaningful relationship doesn't happen overnight. We've got to work at it. It will also take talk, if you'll understand what I mean. You speak with him in the quiet place, from an open Bible. You pray. You hear his voice as he, can, as he communes through his word. But it also takes trust. A genuine willingness from us to walk close beside the shepherd of our souls through all the ups and downs of life, and they will come. We love him because he first loved us, and we trust him because he knows what is best. But then secondly, Paul says that he wants to live for Christ more dynamically. Paul shines the torchlight on, and it's a wonderful phrase, the power of the resurrection. That's a demonstration of power like no other. This was God's gelig night, and we've experienced it. That's what happened in your life and mine. When we trusted Christ as salvation, we, for salvation, we passed from life, from death into life. The stone, as it were, was rolled away. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that he made us alive with Christ and he raised us up with Christ and seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. Do you believe that? If you do, does that enthuse you in any manner? Because it should. And if it doesn't, well, I think you know what you need to do. The power of the cross, that's the power of the risen Christ. The power that is dynamic, it's explosive, it's a potential of such power is phenomenal. That's what Paul is pursuing day by day. There's no need for us to be trounced when we engage with the enemy if we're walking in that level. We step up to the plate and the uh, illustrious triumph of Jesus becomes a reality in our life. We fight the adversary from the point of victory because the Lord is risen. Jesus is alive. Sin has been defeated, as has death hell and the grave and because he's alive through faith we become over overcomers also that dynamic power is available to us every moment of every day not to use trivially but to trust you see of ourselves we can do nothing we are nothing we have nothing but in Christ, the Bible tells us that we are not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. It doesn't say you will be a conqueror. It says you are more than conquerors. So often we fail to adequately cope with the harrowing conflicts that we face in life. It's a constant struggle sometimes for us to live our lives with the purity that we ought to in a very, very filthy, ungodly world. There is only one way for us to make our way through life, and that is to draw on the plenteous resources that we have in Jesus. For we are alive unto God. The power of the resurrection makes all of the difference. The same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is available to every single one of us born again believers. And if we don't make use of it, if we don't appropriate in our lives, 
We cannot blame God if our Christian life and experience is dry and boring. God wants us to be tapped into that power. But then Paul says he wants to suffer with Christ more dependently. Wonder, did you notice how Paul verbalized it in his prayer? A prayer where every word counts. He used the word sharing. But you might be saying, well, sharing what? Well, sharing the joys and the triumphs of Jesus, in the love and the grace of Jesus, in the blessings of Jesus, yes. And all of this and much more, but that's not all that he prayed. He said candidly that he wanted to share in his sufferings. How many of us pray like that? I won't ask for a show of hands. Truth be told, this is more than just sharing in something. The Greek word Paul uses here is koinonia. He's focusing here on fellowship. And the depth of the fellowship is that which is uppermost in his heart and mind. So often we think of fellowship as staying behind in a Sunday morning after a, a, a morning meeting or service, whatever you want to call it, and have a cup of tea and a lovely slice of cake. I'm looking forward to that in May, and those in Kelty will know why. But this is radically different from all of that. Paul's not talking about fellowshipping around a casserole. He's talking about fellowshipping around a cross. And this is fellowship at a whole new level, and it's for you and I. It's a real privilege for us to suffer with him, to bear the scars of battle, to know the pangs that, that break the human heart, to feel the pain of a dysfunctioning body. But you know, that's when we learn. I have learned more over the last 20 years, having suffered and still do 24 hours a day chronic pain, I've learned more during those years than I did in the years when I was perfectly fit. Sometimes that happens. We don't always learn a lot. When things are going swimmingly well, when the trials come, that's where, if we allow it to happen, we will learn lessons through suffering. Charles Wesley expressed it this way, Thy love for a sinner declare, Thy passion and death on the tree, My spirit to Calvary bear, To suffer, and triumph with thee. It entails us taking up and bearing the cross in our lives. Painful experience. It may hurt. It could be sore. It takes undiluted commitment. For there's a price to pay. And it may cost us dear. We may be the butt of cynical jokes. Perhaps ridicule. Or even prone to be ostracized. In all probability will be under misunderstood. But as you read at the end of the Hebrews, there is a reproach to be willingly and gladly born for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's fellowship in his suffering. But then, fourthly, he want, Paul wanted to look for Christ more diligently. You see what's happening here? In the text, and it, it's most unusual, and maybe you noticed that when we read it earlier, 
Paul moves from the resurrection to sacrifice and to death. And on the face of it, it appears to be back to front. It's a bit like putting the cart before the horse. The baseline is we can't have resurrection without death. So he says, becoming like him in his death. That's when we die to self and to sin and to Satan. Not just when we make a commitment of our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, but daily dying to self and sin. When we die to each of these three influences in our lives, then we become more alive than ever before. Because in Jesus, it's the I is dethroned and Christ is enthroned. It's the I that is crucified and Christ is crowned. So the Lord Jesus said himself, it's only when the corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies that it bears much fruit. I could buy a packet of seeds tomorrow and I could put that packet of seeds on one of my shelves and I can guarantee by the end of the summer it will be the same as it was from the day I bought it. But if I plant it on the earth, there will be growth and there will be fruit. Calvary was the aim of the incarnation. He was born to die. He died to live. And the same can be true of your life and mine if we're willing to sign our names to the sentiment so movingly penned by Paul, Lord, I want to know you more. That was his driving ambition. In closing, it's worth noting the phrase that's used in verse 11. It's unique because it's the only place in the New Testament where the, this form of the Greek word for resurrection is used. And it means, and this is terribly bad English, please forgive me, literally it means out resurrection, or, or that is resurrection out from the dead ones. That makes better sense, I hope. And that will happen when the Lord returns for his own, and we will rise to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the rapture of the saints. And I hope that you believe in the rapture because I can tell you from my work throughout this land, 70% of the evangelical church has been the rapture. Not going to happen. Don't believe in it anymore. It's old news. That's disappointing because it will happen. Paul, as it were, scanned the horizon. His ears were cocked and listening for the sound of the trumpet. He had that constant sense of, uh, of anticipation. Is that true of us? Is that true of us now? Will that be true of us tomorrow morning if we open our eyes in the will of God and given another day? Paul was on fire for God. But his desire was to go deeper and deeper into the things of God. And he wanted to reach a higher plane, understanding and experiencing more and more the spiritual riches that were his in and through Christ Jesus. His aspiration is to know God better. And he wants to spend the balance of his years on earth, not just getting along, not even just cruising along, 
but driving on to get to know Christ more intimately, drawing upon his resurrection power more increasingly, enter into his sufferings more personally, and being conformed to his image more completely. Do we want that? Do I don't want that? Do you want that? The chorus sums it up so well, and I trust it will be your prayer this Easter Lord's Day. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to know you more. I want to love you more. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. That will only become reality when we develop the same insatiable desire as Paul had to be thankful for all that God has done for us in the past but to be stretching forward ready to embrace all that God wants to do for you and me in the future oh that we may live in the gain of the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, forgive us for the times where we have just jogged along in our Christian life and experience. Give us that sense of excitement and enthusiasm, not some kind of frothy stuff, but a deep-seated joy and, and excitement because of what you have done for us. And as we come to the close of this Easter Lord's Day, give us a fresh vision of, of all that was involved that we may go forward into an increasingly difficult world on fire. for the Lord Jesus. Father God, we would not want to put on any restrictions to what you are willing to do through us and in us. We just simply want to be vessels that are fit and meet for you to choose and use in whatever way you see fit. And with that in mind, we would surrender our lives to you. And we wait to see where you will lead and guide us. And wherever that may be, may we be willing always to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.